Hey everyone, welcome to session 156 of the Behavioral Observations Podcast. I've got a great show for you. I'm joined by uh, Dr. Adithian Rajaraman, better known as Ditu to friends and colleagues. And we discuss in great detail his work in the area of practical functional assessment and skills-based treatment. Ditu is a former student of podcast favorite Dr. Greg Hanley, and as one might expect, uh, he approaches his work with a similar degree of humility and open-mindedness. Ditu earned his PhD at Western New England University and is now an assistant professor at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. As we discussed in the first few minutes of the show, I met him about four or five years ago at APBA, and I was instantly struck with how well he was able to communicate really complex ideas in an easily digestible manner, and that will become like really apparent as the conversation unfolds. We've kept in touch since then, and I was fortunate enough to find a time where we both could sit down for an in-depth conversation on these topics for a podcast episode. So in this episode, we talk about uh, how we got into the field of ABA, uh, the uh, seemingly false distinction of behavior reduction versus skill instruction, Uh, the basics of the practical functional assessment and skills-based treatment approach to dealing with problem behavior, uh, how to manage caregiver objections to these approaches. Um, We talk about his research in the area of what he calls the enhanced choice model of skill instruction and how to implement these procedures in public school settings uh, or more generally non-research settings. I, I think that will be of particular interest to listeners as that's where kind of most of us are, I would say. Oh, we even uh, kind of relate an anecdote of uh, how he stumped me with a, with an interesting question when I was a panelist at an ABAI event. I think it was the last live one that happened or in person event. Um, you're going to also want to stay through to the very end because he provides some real unique advice, not only for the newly minted BCBAs out there, but for practitioners of all experience levels. The uh, Patreon version of the show involves an extra 45 to 50 minutes of content in which we talk about his passion for the sport of cricket. And uh, we spent a lot of time talking about questions that we've gotten from patrons. Uh, Last but not least, as some of you might know, uh, Ditu is uh, quite the singer, and he ends this bonus footage by sharing some of his vocal stylings. So to get access to this content, as well as uh, other commercial-free podcast feeds, check out patreon.com forward slash behavioral observations. And while we're on the topic of Patreon, uh, D2 has agreed to do a Zoom call with members where he'll take questions directly from uh, patrons. And so uh, be on the lookout for that. We're, we'll get that scheduled hopefully soon. Uh, I should also add that D2 insisted that I give some shout outs to a lot of his uh, colleagues who helped them with his research. And they include the aforementioned uh, Greg Hanley, as well as Holly Gover, uh, Johanna Staubitz, John Staubitz, Kathleen Simcoe, Rachel Mitris, Robin Landa, and Kelsey Rupel. Uh, this research has recently been published in Behavior Analysis and Practice as well. I've got a link of that, to that uh, article in the show notes, so I recommend you check it out when you get a chance. Uh, and if you liked uh, Ditu's approach and want to learn more from him, my friends at Behavior University are hosting a webinar with him. It's called Enhanced Choice Model trauma-informed processes for assessing and treating dangerous behavior. Uh, As most of you will know, Behavior University is a longtime sponsor of the podcast. And so if you're interested in this event or any of the offerings they have, uh, use the code podcast at checkout to save a little bit of money. Um, Let's see. Also, if you're looking for a grad program and you really want to dive deep into this area, uh, we also want to put in a plug for uh, Ditu's program at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. They're accepting applicants to their master's program in ABA, which is closely affiliated with the Kennedy Krieger Institute. And uh, Ditu is accepting doc students in the Applied Developmental Psychology program. And uh, Last but not least, in addition to the Behavior University and Patreon groups, this episode is also brought to you by HowToABA.com. And uh, at HowToABA.com, they know being a BCBA can be lonely at and overwhelming. And at HowToABA.com, they help BCBAs feel supported and confident by providing easy-to-access printable CEUs along with a collaborative community environment. 
So for more information, go to howtoaba.com, join BX Resource. And if you join and use the code BOP, you'll receive 10% off your yearly subscription, which does include CEU events. So uh, I think that's it for opening comments. So without any further delay, let's get right to this uh, really fun and wide-ranging conversation with Dr. Adithian D2 Rajaraman. Welcome to the Behavioral Observations Podcast, stimulating talk for today's behavior analysts. Now, here's your host, Matt Sicoria. Dr. Aditi and Roger Raman, thanks for joining me today on the Behavioral Observations Podcast. Boy, it's finally good after so many, uh, so many months and you know, perhaps over a, more than a year, I think, of talking about doing this. It's so good to get you on the show. Uh, it's, it's great to see you. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. It is uh, obviously a real pleasure to be here. And yes, I'm a, a longtime listener. So to be here is just kind of a dream come true. Oh, um, excellent. Excellent. Well, um, you know, it, it's funny too. We were just chatting a little bit before we got recorded, uh, get, got recording here is that uh, I actually tried to capture some some audio footage at APBA in New Orleans a few years ago of, of, of you and some of your colleagues who are uh, grad students of uh, Greg Hanley's at the time. And uh, I had a little bit of a uh, uh, operator error on my digital recorder. So uh, the, the, your, your appearance on the podcast is uh, could, could have been much earlier were it not from my mistake, as well as those of your uh, your colleagues at, uh, at Western New England. Well, uh, I think that's okay. I'm sure I put my foot in my mouth then. <laughs> I'm hoping that I don't uh, again today, but... Uh... Well, all, all kidding aside, uh, all, and humility aside, uh, one of the things that struck me about that particular symposium was, uh, you know, everyone wants to see Greg Hanley present, right? That's, you know, like he's perhaps the, you know, the, the, the you know, in the top five, you know, perhaps the single biggest draw, if you will, in terms of conference speakers and things like that. But one of the things that was really noteworthy about that symposium is that I think there were four or five of you guys presenting and all of you guys really kicked major butt in your presentations and really delivered solid, engaging, entertaining talks that, by the way, were very uh, <laughs> uh, meaningful in terms of their content as well. So it wasn't just showmanship. So that that was certainly something that uh, that that motivated me to run up to you guys with a microphone <laughs> after after the, everything concluded. So um but uh, um, we're getting ahead of ourselves a little bit. So what I want to do, uh, uh, to do is to start with uh, how you got into ABA and, you know, how you got into working with with Greg. And obviously, we're going to get into, you know, uh, practical function assessment, skills based treatment, et cetera. But uh, let's start with your your ABA backstory. So what was your first exposure to the field? How'd you get into it? What made you decide you want to pursue it as a career? You got it. Uh, thank you. Thank you for saying those things. That's That's very kind of you. Uh, it, I, I guess I would start back in, in high school. Uh, I was kind of a speech and, and theater kid. And in Michigan, we have a speech tournament called individual events or forensics. And how that kind of works is that, uh, high schoolers pick pieces of literature and then they, they interpret that literature in, in a competitive manner. So we'd spend our Saturdays in, in high schools, just watching people perform, and from a young age, from my freshman year, I was always drawn to the pieces that depicted special needs, intellectual disability, uh, or, or something of the sort. So I would, it, it was maybe awkward to think about now, but I would fanboy these, these other high schoolers that were just, you know, doing a, a really great kind of uh, interpretation of cerebral palsy or, or autism. And that really motivated me to take a, a psych course in high school which was phenomenal. I was taught by an incredible teacher and uh, going into college that was on the mind. I can, I guess you could, I, I, I wanted to get inside the mind of, of individuals with disabilities and I wanted to learn what made them tick. Uh, however, there was a bit of parental and community pressure to go down the pre-med route. Uh, this is something that's probably familiar to a lot of uh, Indian American or Asian American kids was I, I went to school poised to go down the pre-med route. I needed to quite literally give it the college try. <laughs> I did. Uh, and then I, uh, within a year, was said, that's not for me. But in order to sort of uh, appease 
what I thought I needed to appease my parents. I, I chose a major that had the word science in it, literally. I, I went with a major called philosophy, neuroscience, psychology. Uh, and that was uh, down in, at Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri. And that was a, another kind of blessing in disguise because then I, I, I met a couple of the faculty that were uh, behavior analysts. And when I asked about research opportunities uh, for, with a particular professor, she said, I don't have any on-campus research opportunities, but I recently uh, took a couple of cases in the community, uh, some young children with autism, would you like to be a therapist? So I said, sign me up, that sounds uh, incredible. I spent a, a couple of years working in home just as a, a what we now call a technician. Back then I was just felt like I was kind of like a glorified babysitter uh, because I wasn't uh, quite well versed in all the methodology and things like that. Um, but nevertheless, I, I was teaching this, this young child skills, whether we knew it or not, and it was really rewarding. Um, in another sense, I mentioned I was kind of a theater kid. I always just enjoyed hanging out with uh, young children and, and adolescents with uh, special needs. Uh, kind of selfishly, it was an opportunity for me to continue to practice my, my voice acting skills and to do my little Mickey Mouse and Elmo impressions. Um, and that was always something that uh, was very reinforcing to get at, at least one person who enjoyed, you know, my Elmo impression. <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> so I, I stuck with it. And then by the time college was, was done and I didn't, I hadn't done the MCAT, I wasn't, uh, on track to go to med school, I, I needed a plan. And so I reached out to this professor, her name is Dr. Sarah Essel. And I said, hey, I, I really want to, uh, I think, pursue behavior analysis. Do you have any advice on where I can go? And she said, sure, there's a lot of great programs. You could go to Southern Illinois, Northern Texas, Western Kansas, Boston. And I said, Boston sounds good. Uh, so <laughs> that was how I uh, heard about this uh, program out right outside of Boston called the New England Center for Children. I was fortunate to get hired there. Um, and as I mentioned, I was I, I kind of went with the intent to go study behavior analysis because I'd really enjoyed the hands-on work and I wanted to learn more. Um, but once I got to the New England Center, they they made a convincing argument for me to pursue special education in that on like day one of orientation, they're like, we have this program that's a little bit less uh, expensive and a little bit quicker to complete. And this other program is a little more challenging and more expensive. And I was kind of like a burnt out college student at that point. So I said, path of least resistance. And, and but thank goodness for that, because I really got to see special education and behavior analysis as two different approaches to trying to solve similar problems, you mm -hmm. know, and, and I got some practical experience uh, teaching schools and uh, kids in public schools uh, and things of that sort. But all the while, there was this thread of, of man, that behavior analysis stuff seems very interesting um, there was this sort of dichotomy. So I was at the New England Center for Children for about five years, and there was this weird dichotomy where they almost it almost seemed like the folks that do behavior analysis work on behavior reduction, problem behavior reduction. The folks that do special ed work on skill acquisition. And I later learned that that is not a, a distinction that that necessarily holds true, that, that behavior analysis can do both, special education can do both. That was my experience early on in my career too, and I obviously I think things are kind of evolving, uh, consider uh, you know considerably. But uh, yeah, I, I had a very similar, uh, I guess, erroneous point of view or uh, uh, set of observations, if you will. Yeah, it was it was kind of almost like self-selecting. Like the folks that had that master's in special ed would go on to be the people that coordinated the educational programming. And, uh, you know, the, uh, by contrast, the folks that studied behavior analysis were doing the functional assessments and that stuff always, I was always interested in it. I, I started off by working with some adolescents, some teenagers who were some, some big, big dudes and they were in, in a residential program. And uh, that was really where I started to fall in love with behavior analysis. With, and I started to see the power of uh, using reinforcement to, to change behavior, to, to get, to, you know, more meaningful outcomes uh, out of children. So, so that's kind of my, my backstory. And as a, a, by virtue of being at the New England Center for Children, I had the opportunity to go work in, in the Abu Dhabi school. And uh, at that point, I was in a, whatever, post-master's specialization to get my BCBA. And uh, Dr. Hanley came out to Abu Dhabi. He gave a presentation on some new, exciting research about synthesized contingencies and functional analyses and skill-based treatments. That caught my eye, caught my ear. And so I as with many other fanboys, 
I went and read all the research, watched all the videos that I could. And uh, just, uh, somehow we, we developed a relationship. Dr. Hanley was kind enough to invite me to, to sit in on his lab for a year. At that point, I didn't have any behavior analytic research experience, uh, but I sat in on the lab with the intent to apply for a doctoral program. And uh, here I am a few years later uh, doing behavior analysis. And, and now I, I teach over at UMBC down in Baltimore County. Uh, I teach psychology and, and behavior analysis mostly to undergraduates, but also to some graduate students as well. Very cool. And so what was it about the, uh, the you know, um, what, what differed in terms of Greg's approach versus some of the other approaches to functional assessment that kind of really um, intrigued you and made you want to work uh, in that environment? Yeah, so I think that it was, a, a confluence of events. One was that I was learning the terminology, the vocabulary, the conceptual system of behavior analysis at the time. So there's, when you're kind of practicing on the floor as a technician, you hear reinforcement, you hear DRO, but you may not fully grasp the, the underlying con concepts uh, under, you know, the concepts underlying it. And, and while I was learning about reinforcement, about the difference per se between behavior analysis and behavior modification, I was reflecting on some of the procedures that we had had in place with, especially some of the older boys that I worked with that were more or less BMOD. We would set up these contracts. If you have this perfect week, we'll take you out to your favorite restaurant. And despite the fact that those were fleetingly effective, hearing Dr. Hamley talk about a, a very kind of lean way to take the, all the reinforcers that are likely relevant to problem behavior and use those same events to teach other skills in those contexts. That had a, a, a power to it and an authenticity to it that, that was really attractive to me. And then furthermore, just hearing about some of the outcomes with, with respect to kids that were similar to the kids that I worked with, that these kids were now back into their home if they were on the doorstep to go to residential services, hearing that these parents were calling the shots saying, well, I won't be satisfied until this child can go to Target and not get a toy. Those were things that spoke to my soul because I was like, I know what those, what those children are like. And we, we set up our trips to Target, for example, with the express purpose of getting them the toy that they, they want. So uh, it made sense to me to hear kind of to peel back a layer and hear what parental and caregiver goals are and to see that incorporated into treatment was something that I, I also really, really spoke to me. I see. And so it sounds like you were learning the, the 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 basics of behavior analysis at you know kind of uh, at the same time that you had exposure to the the concept of synthesized reinforcement for problem behavior for someone like myself and I think for many behavior analysts uh, to wrap our minds around that approach requires managing some some conceptual baggage that we might have from earlier training. You know, where, you know, I, I remember going to a, a workshop once and it's like, you know, if the behavior is multiply controlled, you didn't have enough experimental control in your analysis, you know, or, uh, uh, or words to that effect. Um, and did you have, so it's, did, so is my assumption correct? Did, was that not an issue for you since you were kind of coming up contemporaneously with, with, with the evolution of, you know, the ISCA and the practical functional assessment, did you have to kind of wrestle with that or it, did it just kind of gel with you because you were already, uh, you were kind of immersed in that environment as it was being developed? Yeah, it wasn't so much an issue that I wrestled with, but but Rat, this is another great point was that when I, when I heard Dr. Hanley kind of describe synthesized reinforcement as a possibility, it really resonated with my subjective, my anecdotal kind of experiences with okay. some of the kids that I worked with. So especially some of the older fellas that were at the New England Center who had been there for a decade or more, they often were, were labeled as like this, as the attention maintained client, the escape maintained client. And we were introduced to them uh, uh, under those terms, you know, like well, th okay. this guy, he's the escape guy. So I remember being told that, that all of this child's problem behavior is escape maintained, but seeing in the moment that it was clearly evoked by something that wasn't necessarily a, a demand or, or something of the sort. When we would terminate their, their trade and their reinforcement, we would see problem behavior, yet we were responding to it as though there was some sort of escape contingency 
at play. So it was more so just Dr. Hanley gave me what I, I think the language to, that, that matched on to what I thought I was seeing on the floor. Um, I see. Okay. So, so there, there, the old thinking there was, was more so just, you know, we get uh, acculturated in, into these, the places where we work. And I was bre- brought up and bred on the notion that there can only be one reinforcer for all the problem behavior. So that definitely, it, but I, I wasn't a student of that. So I wasn't like, you know, staunchly behind it. No, there must be only one. I was just like learning new language to talk about my, the, the things that I was seeing right in front of me. Nice. Uh, so let's, I guess, for the sake of uh, anyone who, who may not be up to speed on this, uh, can you give like a thumbnail sketch of the practical functional assessment process uh, and, and, and the skills training part of that as well? Sure. Thumbnail sketch. I'll try to be as brief yeah, as I, I know. can. Like, can, can you <laughs> summarize, you know, over 20 peer reviewed papers in five minutes? <laughs> no. Well, I, I, you're up to the task. You can do it. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, get, I'll give it my best. I think that uh, a great place to start is, is when we talk about a practical functional assessment that, that aims to, it, it does not aim to identify the function of problem behavior regarding its classification. It doesn't attempt to put problem behavior in a particular bin that is this, this child is the escape kid, this child is the, the attention kid, but rather it, it, it's, it attempts to create recreate a powerfully motivating context in which to teach social adaptive uh, replacement skills that that can perhaps have generality beyond the teaching context. So when we start off by by conducting interviews with with people that have experienced uh, problem behavior, and we ask about what are all of the events that possibly trigger behavior, what are all of the events that, that you use to maybe calm down or resolve the problem behavior, what we're trying to recreate is a a uh, highly controlled context where we can turn that behavior kind of on and off using nothing but that the contingency that has been reported by people familiar with the behavior. So uh, I, I, I think that that first step in, in doing the PFA has is no, I don't think of it as we're trying to call it, we're trying to figure out the function of behavior. We're mm-hmm. trying to uh, identify a context where we can control behavior with great precision or we can turn behavior on quickly upon you know putting in uh, some some of the EOs that are being reported, and where we can turn behavior off uh, immediately and keep it off by delivering some of the reinforcers that parents or caregivers are reporting uh, that they that they do in the home. So uh, to me, it's 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 all about a inc- uh, cr- increasing motivation to do the things that we want kids to be doing, especially in the situations that are reported to be troublesome, challenging, and difficult for them. Then if we, once we've established that condition where we're like, uh, that, that uh, I think some of your speakers in a recent episode who are talking about PFA in the, in the for real world or IRL, right. uh, <laughs> they, they were saying that there, there's something very powerful about controlling behavior uh, with great precision. And I think that that's a, a really true uh, and great point. There was another um, early experience I had working with Dr. Hanley that where I was like, I have never felt that before, just being able to turn behavior on and off when I, when I put in these, these events in place and just being able to do that on the front end uh, really has legs to, to, to use that same context to teach a, a complex repertoire of skills that, that work not only under challenging situations, but in novel contexts that come up where the kids um, may feel out of their comfort zone and out of their depth. I see. And and so, and once you understand the conditions that can turn on and shut off problem behavior, uh, what is the process from there? Great. Yes. So, so that, sorry, I, I said I'd answer it, give you the di- reader digest version. And I just spoke about assessment. That's okay. uh, well, <laughs> once we turn behavior on and off um, and we, we prove to ourselves and we confirm with, with the caregivers that this kind of matches the ecology of what, what they're experiencing in their environment then we just very slowly and 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 carefully uh, replace the bad behavior with the with with better behavior. We replace the behavior we don't want to see. We start by by teaching really simple communicative responses uh, that are low effort uh, by design and that are just designed to completely eliminate uh, or render problem behavior unnecessary by empowering kids with words, actions, gestures that can produce those same reinforcers. Once we prove to ourselves that this 
contingency is powerful enough to, to teach one new skill, then we teach some more new skills. We might uh, improve the complexity of that those communicative responses so that they're a little more developmentally appropriate. We might teach kids specifying man so they can not only ask to have all the reinforcers, but then they could teach us which reinforcers are valuable uh, in the moment. Uh, and then we continue, once, once we've shown to ourselves, taught the client, taught their parents that, that these new skills, uh, like I said, have legs, that they're maintained over time. Then we introduce newer context. We introduce some level of disappointment where we teach kids, hey, you can't always have it your way. And we teach them an explicit response to that uh, disappointment, what we call a tolerance response, uh, which is just another level of, of evidence and validation that the, that the contingency is still motivating uh, the child in a, in a powerful way. Uh, and, and we also kind of just give them, I like to say we teach kids to, to cope, uh, communicate and cooperate. So that they so that that second step of, of explicit response to disappointment is sort of like a coping skill. Like you can't have it your way. What are you going to do? Take a deep breath and say, that's everything's going to be all right. And once we've kind of, uh, done that, then we slowly tar- start to shape cooperative skills, uh, contextually appropriate behavior, if you will, during periods of non-reinforcement. So that's really when the work, the magic happens. The we try to get them to this promised land that that parents and teachers want uh, of their child or of their adolescent. We we want them. They, they want them not only having their toys all the time, but perhaps playing cooperatively with their siblings or doing homework or doing chores, daily living skills. And so there's a very careful shaping that happens after we've taught communication and toleration skills to build cooperation with adult uh, instruction. And we can stretch that out in, in, in multiple ways and across multiple contexts. And, but once we have a pretty solid, uh, pretty solid evidence that the child has learned at least a, a, a one cooperative repertoire, then we start to expand that into new contexts with new caregivers. We might bring parents in. Uh, we might try to stretch it across longer time periods. So really what we're looking at at the end is, is we, we take all of the situations that were reported to be challenging, by, which is defined by the fact that they were evoking problem behavior, and we teach kids not one, not two, not three, but, but, but several skills that they can emit in lieu of problem behavior that uh, all the, that all of which kind of get them back to their promised land, which is that synthesized reinforcement, get them the things that they want, that they need, and uh, that are important to them in the moment, but all through adaptive social skills. You probably already know that Behavior University creates engaging ABA content for new and experienced professionals. Whether it's RBT training or webinars for BACD CEUs, Behavior University has you covered. Behavior University is launching an interactive BACD supervisor training, an innovative approach to supervision training with interactive video to practice decision making and tools to create a personalized portfolio to take with you when you're done. The course is designed to guide new supervisors through applying the important skills required for effective supervision to their own unique experiences. Behavior University also offers two tiers of RBT training. Choose the essentials for the 40-hour course or the premium to add a full kit of study materials and full and a full-length practice exam. In addition to these features, supervisors can now purchase access to these RBT courses so they can monitor any RBT training for course progress and quiz performance. Supervisors will also receive tools and content to support the training of new staff. Users rave about Behavior University RBT training, calling it the clearest instruction, the course that made it stick, amongst other comments. BCBA say that their staff clearly get it after taking their course. So to check out what they've built and to get podcast-specific discounts, head on over to behavioruniversity.com forward slash observations. One of the things that came up in the show that you referenced, and for the listeners, that's session 145 with the consultants for children. Um, one of the things that came up we talked about then is, uh, you know, perhaps some caregiver objections to some of those early stages of treatment, whereas, you know, basically you're instituting some, some whether it's a demand or something, you know, you're, you're imparting some EO, uh, some evocative stimuli on, on you know, to the learner, uh, and then you're basically letting them quote unquote get away with it essentially by saying my way or you know can I do my own thing or what what have you uh, 
what what has been your experience with caregiver objections to that based off of perhaps not being able to see the entire process all the way out you know you have a perspective of having done many many iterations of these these processes of of getting to that as you say the promised land um, but a, but a novel teacher uh, you, you know someone who or a parent or whatever may not see that and um so how, how do you how do, how do you handle that when someone's like uh, you know they're just saying to you, hey, it looks like they're just spending so much time in reinforcement. And as soon as you ask them to do anything, they just say, my way. They're just kind of getting out of doing anything. And where is this going? You know, how do you, what, what's your typical response to that? How do you handle those certain situations? Yeah, I think that my response has been shaped by my uh, experiences. That is, early on, I had probably less good response to that concern. But uh, a couple things is, are that, that obviously this procedure makes more sense for a child who's kind of in crisis or who's actively engaging in a lot of dangerous behavior. And when the situation is that dire, when parents are coming to our clinic, for example, or if we're, we're meeting them and they're at their wits end or that they're worried that they're going to have to hospitalize their child or something of the sort, we don't tend to see as much of this pushback. And that framing is helpful, which is to say, if, if you if you're at a point where you are uh, satisfied with your child's behavior such that you don't want them communicating in lieu of it, then uh, then why are we you know why why are we doing this process? But but that's not usually the case. Usually you you can kind of talk about well the alternative is that they're engaging in this erratic, unpredictable problem behavior for extended periods of time, and it's because there isn't a lot of order. Perhaps it, uh, it's likely because there's not a lot, lot of order in their life, so they use that behavior as a tool to get what they need. Um, when there's pushback, oh, he's spending too much time in reinforcement. Uh, more recently, we're, we're kind of able to get through the earlier phases of communication and toleration training relatively quickly uh, and, and with, with a high level of efficacy such that we can move on to doing the, the, the legwork of, of teaching cooperative skills during periods of non-reinforcement. So if they see on day two that the child is just saying my way and they're, getting, they're in reinforcement 96% of the session, then one piece of uh, of comfort that I give them is I promise we're not going to be here for long. It, look, they're doing it so well that I even tomorrow we're going to teach them a new skill. Um, uh, so 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 it's not a place that w- w- we're rarely there for a very long time. And oftentimes, if we are there for a very long time, it's a sign that we didn't do the assessment uh, properly to know that the child is is motivated enough to learn these new skills. So. Being able to have had uh, to have accumulated experiences has, has helped me understand a little bit more about, I guess, the timeline of it all. And it also in consulting, it's, it's helped encourage me to encourage folks that are doing this process to not stick around there for too long. To don't as soon as you feel comfortable, maybe a little bit bored to, to imagine that the client is also likely bored just saying <laughs> my way to get their, their reinforcers. Um, Excellent. Yeah, does that does that arrive yeah. at an answer? Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, and I think uh, I I would, you know, I was going to get to this later, but might as well bring it up now. You know, for uh, some of the learners, and so you share with me a paper uh, that you know, I, I can't recall. Is it in press right now? Has it been accepted for pub? Where, where where's the enhanced choice model paper in the in the timeline so I can reference it properly? Sure. So it has been, yeah, it's received final acceptance at behavior analysis and practice. Okay. So it is, I guess you could say it is in press. All right. Um so you were gracious enough to sh- uh share the uh share it with me. And um one of the things that was noteworthy about some of the learners, if not all of them, is that uh, they had a, a, a fairly well-developed repertoire of language skills. And uh, so um, has it been your experience that with individuals with, you know, more or less intact communicative repertoires that this uh, this omnibus man phase, uh, as you said, goes really quickly, but is it uh, – and, and to do the rest of the stages go all, also quickly because they're essentially mm. formulating rules and et cetera, et cetera. You know, can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, because I, we, I think some of the, uh, I guess where I'm kind of, I, I don't know if there's a distinction to be made between like kind of contingency shaping every single aspect of the full, you know, uh, repertoire of 
uh, functional communication, toleration, and, and cooperation uh, versus, you know, a, a very, uh, like I said, uh, you know, cognitively intact learner who's like, oh, I get it. If I just say this, then that happens. And if I say, okay, no problem, you know, sometimes I get what I want. Sometimes I don't, you know, uh, can, can you talk about that a little bit? Do you understand what I'm, I guess I'm, the point I'm trying to meander towards? I think so. It's, it's kind of like, what is the, what's the effect of verbal shaping or, or what, what are the yeah. sensitivities around that? Uh, I, I, I'm a fan of it. Uh, I think for, for multiple reasons. One, one thing is you're totally right. When we can just kind of tell a child, Hey, if you just say my way, uh, it'll, it'll work out for you. And then a minute later, we can prove to them that we mean what we say by reinforcing their, their man. It has a powerful effect. There's some say do correspondence as a communicative partner. I'm telling you that I will reinforce. If you say my way, I'm telling you that I won't reinforce uh, your whining uh, try it on for size and, and see how that works. And uh, that, that, that help we're, we're specifying contingencies for them. That can, uh, when we do it in later phases, essentially what we're telling the, the child, and this kind of goes back to the fact that every step of the way, we're using the same synthesized contingency to shape different skills under similar conditions. We're kind of using, I think that Stokes and Bear might call this tactic mediating generalization, but we're saying kind of, hey, bud, yesterday, remember how I told you that you just needed to say my way and you'd get your, your way. Uh, and, and that did work out for you. If you trusted me then, if you trust me now, then, then please trust that when I tell you no, and you just say no problem, or you, you know, when I tell you, you can have your way and you say, that's all good with me, that I will indeed uh, reinforce that as well. So we, we build upon former trust. I like to say, which uh, perhaps not the most behavior analytic language to go about it, but but we build upon former trust and we also mediate child skills by saying these same skills and maybe some new ones will be effective in a novel context, in a novel environment. So that has been extraordinarily uh, helpful with children that, that have those language skills. But if I can add another uh, layer to that, I also think that it it's it, we move toward kind of a, a shared governance model of therapy. We move toward a, I'm here to, to teach with you, to not, not teach to you. Um, I'm here to, to support you in a journey to, to having more, more adaptive repertoire, to support you in, in not needing to feel frustrated and, and, and upset uh, under these conditions. And so when we use that language, we're not only specifying the response that will produce reinforcement, but I also like to think that we are kind of uh, fostering therapeutic rapport and uh, fostering a relationship that is that is ideally more reinforcing than than otherwise. Hey there, I just want to take a quick break and thank the folks over at howtoaba.com for sponsoring this episode. They have put together a really amazing community of practitioners. I think they have something over like a thousand members where uh, practitioners can uh, get support amongst one another. They can get CEUs. Uh, you even get access to uh, printables and things like that, so you don't have to reinvent the wheel. So if you're a BCBA, and especially if you're a BCBA kind of practicing without a lot of other B, you know, like-minded colleagues or like-minded behavior peeps, as I like to say, uh, this could be something that could help you quite a bit. Um, it, it, you know, as someone who practices in a solo context myself, uh, I certainly can understand that... Uh, it really can be hard sometimes, and it's always really exciting when you happen to find another BCBA to talk with and bounce ideas off of and things like that. Uh, so if you're in that situation, go to howtoaba.com, uh, and you're going to want to look for the behavior resource or BX resource. So the uh, specific URL is howtoaba.com forward slash join BX resource and see if the howtoaba.com community is right for you. So uh, again, that's howtoaba.com and I uh, hope you get a chance to check it out if it is something that uh, you think would be helpful. All right, let's get back to this interview with Ditu. All right, so I, I appreciate that. Uh, that's um, So we broached the topic of your, you know, the enhanced choice model. So let's, let's, let's get into that. What, what does that mean in the context of uh, practical functional assessment and skills-based treatment, um, you know, and, and with regard to the 
uh, the the two experiments that were in that paper, what what is what does that you know practically mean for the pr procedures uh, that that you wrote up? Sure, happy to talk about it. Do you mind if I tell a little anecdote to, yeah. to set, it, set it up? Please do. So uh, uh, I had been working in Dr. Hanley's outpatient clinic, what we called the Life Skills Clinic, as a as a doctoral student, and uh, we worked with a handful of of children. Uh, who'd come in with their families. And and right at the jump, I want to say that there's a really different service del delivery model than working in a residential setting or working in a school where you kind of are working with them uh, for most of their day. This is a situation where you have sort of the luxury of really establishing new stimulus control because they're visiting you one hour out of the, out of the day, three or four days a week in an entirely different universe, a university classroom building. So with most children, we're able to you know, uh, interview parents, discover what is uh, what is reinforcing, uh, and and put a lot of those items, activities, and interactions into a room. Bring a child in, close the door, hit record, and and do our 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 you know our practice based research where we conduct FAs and and functional communication training and what have you. Um, and there was one customer who came in, and he was he wasn't too old; he was only nine or ten at the time, but he was a bigger fella, and. Uh, when he when we did the same thing and we populated a room with a bunch of reinforcers, hoping that he would stay in that room, uh, we we conducted our FA and it involved us interrupting his way of doing things and asking him to to put his toys down and come do some some writing work or play by play a game but by adult rules. Uh, essentially, what had happened was this this learner we'll call him Jeffrey. He he engaged in a teeny tiny amount of uh, of precursor behavior that we reinforced, but that he he didn't like that too much. It 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 really ticked him off. And this was a a, a young man who'd experienced uh, various types of counseling and therapy before. So he kind of took one look at the trial where we said, "Let me do the work," and he's like, "You know what? Screw this. I'm out of here. Like you you I know I know what you're up to." So despite the fact that we were like, sure, you can have things your way, we can go back to playing, he wanted to get out. And so he, he made it for the door. And as I said, we typically close the door and we typically keep the door closed for a couple of reasons. So th this may not necessarily apply to, to, the, to the everyday clinic, but we kept our door closed for the integrity of the analysis so that our video camera could capture all the behavior. But also because we were in a university building, there was literally undergrads <laughs> learning about behavior analysis across the hall. and. Uh, essentially what we saw in, in our first day of an analysis, which are usually very safe, mind you, uh, was we, we, it led to a, a really dangerous episode. This dude was basically wrestling with me to get out and he was yelling some, some NSFW stuff uh, at me. Uh, and, and we, you know, we were worried that other students, uh, other, other undergrads might hear it, but we were also worried that if he got out, that he might attack someone. Okay. I, Sorry to put in another break here, but I think it's important to note that uh, if you want to see this actual story in action, the actual video of, of this session, I believe, is in the 10-hour course for the Practical Functional Assessment and Skills-Based Treatment course over at fdfbc.com. I, I took the course after uh, conducting this interview and, of course, saw uh, Ditu in, uh, in the sessions that uh, Dr. Hanley was showing the audience. So it was kind of funny to kind of connect those dots after seeing the, the videos and then re-listening to this podcast in post-production. Um, if you want to... Uh, uh, get some of those training events over at ftfpc.com. And if you want to get 20% off, uh, consider joining the uh, the Patreon group uh, that we talked about at the beginning of the show. Uh, that is yet another benefit of the being a Patreon member. Um, so what you want to do is go to patreon.com forward slash behavioral observations. And along with some all the other benefits, uh, depending on what tier you select, um, you can get 20% off all the FTF trainings, including this particular one that I'm referring to right now. So uh, that is the, uh, the last break of the podcast. So let's get back to the conclusion of it. And so it was a very dangerous, high stakes kind of scenario. And we failed, I would say. We, we had an unsuccessful analysis because we certainly weren't able to turn behavior off. And this was a, a, pro, a client profile he was 
10. He had generalized anxiety disorder. He had an emotional behavior disorder uh, or he had emotional behavior classification in school. It was something that we weren't necessarily used to working with before. And it just seemed clear in those moments. I mean, he was articulating with his verbal behavior. Dad, why did you bring me here? Like, I, I, I hate people like this. Why I'm never coming back here again. We kind of realized that our model of doing things in that closed door was not going to cut it for this client. We were not in a position at a, in our outpatient university clinic. We didn't have um, training in, in restraint and seclusion procedures. And that wasn't something that we, we wanted to do. It's either we'll serve We'll come up with other tactics to turn behavior off, aka deliver a bunch of reinforcers, or we can't serve that family. So we were at a literal crossroads with Jeffrey's family, and we were at, uh, ready to discharge, but then we just kind of brainstormed as a team, Dr. Hanley, some of my colleagues, um, uh, and, we, and we basically came up with a, a motto. We said, what, will, what would happen if we did keep the door open, uh, if we didn't restrict uh, because to, to also be frank, there were clear reinforcements on the other side of the door. Jeffrey wanted to be with his dad. He wanted to be away from me. And we mm -hmm. weren't allowing that to happen despite saying, you're in reinforcement, you're doing things your way. Um, and so when we opened the door, we developed this model that we call the enhanced choice model. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's entirely based on Jeffrey's choice, uh, voluntary choice to participate in treatment or not. So we uh, rather than closing that door, I like to say we opened three doors. The first door is that skill-based treatment room uh, where we did our procedure, and we had a couple of modifications that I can talk about. But we also opened another door uh, that was another clinic room, and we populated it with the same reinforcers that were in the skill-based treatment room, but we called it the hangout space, and we told Jeffrey on his next visit to the clinic, hey, but if there's any point in time where you don't like what's happening in this practice room, in the skill-based treatment room, please feel free to come to this hangout space. And we told Jeffrey in this hangout space, we will never bother you. We will never ask you to do those things. We'll never ask you to relent your, your toys, any things of that sort. So that was door number two. And, uh, and uh, again, I just want to emphasize that all of the uh, stimuli, all the events and interactions that were in there were the events that parents had kind of nominated as relevant to the problem behavior. Um, we did ultimately get a differentiated functional analysis. So we had some level of scientific confirmation that those events were important. Um, but then this third door was also, listen, if you don't want to be here, if you're fed up for the day and you want to leave, we will honor that. No questions asked. Uh, with, with some of the younger clients, it's sort of like their parents drove a long way. So they'd come into the clinic and then they'd be there for the hour and we would just work through their problem behavior. But with Jeffrey, that didn't seem tenable. Um, and it didn't seem uh, like the, the right way to treat him. So he had three options now, choose to practice, choose to hang out or exit, leave, leave for the day. And that's sort of the, the context for the, that, that's the enhanced choice model. That's what we mean by having an enhanced choice is you can not only choose the reinforcers to, to, con, to consume in the practice room, but you can also choose to in, interact with them non-contingently, or you can choose to get the heck out of Dodge if, if you're fed up. Okay. All right. That makes, uh, uh, that, that was very helpful. I, 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 I understand it more fully as a result of that. So I appreciate that. And it's also noteworthy to, to think that this whole concept was, uh, was born out of one case. Uh, and, and that's, uh, I, I always love, so I, I appreciate that anecdote about Jeffrey for that purpose too, because it's just, sometimes it's funny to just hear how some of these things develop and, you know, the, the, I guess necessity is the mother of invention, right? You know, and so <laughs> yes, it's, it's uh it's cool to hear the uh the the backstory of of what went into the you know the the I guess the brainstorming that uh, that created this model. Yes, and and to to Dr. Hanley's credit, I know that he had done uh, similar such things, sort of just out in the out in practice and in consultation, where it was sort of like, well, we don't want to. You know, it kind of boils down to not wanting to f do the follow through when there's behavior that might be sensitive to escape. We didn't want to do the escape extinction. No, man, you're going to stay here and we're going to do math and I'm, I'm going to hand over hand you. And I know that in schools and other settings that Dr. Hanley had had sort of a model where it's like problem behavior will produce just a, a break, just escape, but appropriate behavior will produce a much more enriched break, break with positive reinforcers. And that actually, you know, that that exists in the in the literature, for sure, I think there's a Hawk and McComas study that might that might have evaluated something similar. 
but nevertheless, it was, it was, you know, the, the time was right. We didn't want to, we didn't want to discharge. We didn't want to not be able to serve this family. Um, and, uh, Another thing that kind of came about that, because as we were brainstorming, a lot of us just in that moment, us doctoral students who were working in the clinic were not pumped about offering free synthesized reinforcement in another room. That was really foreign to us based off of our experiences as clinicians and practitioners. But uh, in another sense, I, I've worked with a hundred Jeffreys. I've worked with a lot of uh, clients that present in a similar way to Jeffrey, where they, they're he has very strong language because he's very particular about what he likes and doesn't like. He has, he really likes to do things in a particular way and he's very combative. And even that combativeness can often escalate into really dangerous episodes of problem behavior. Uh, when I thought about this notion of, of just always offering reinforcement, whether for problem behavior or good behavior, I did think this is something that I've never tried with any other client before. When I worked with clients in, the, in a residential setting, the, the, culture is sort of like, well, we have the personnel to put your behavior on extinction. We have the personnel to follow through on any kind of task demands. And I had never experienced, well, what would happen if, even if problem behavior occurs, you just kind of give in, in a sense, you, you just sort of, even for the problem behavior. Earlier today, we were talking about how it's giving in when it's appropriate communication, but we're talking about a situation where even the problem behavior would be uh, met with reinforcement. But uh, we were pleased to discover that that n not only did it really uh, render problem behavior unnecessary, problem behavior almost never occurred throughout the duration of the study for all five participants, but it didn't necessarily mean that kids would exclusively choose to go into that space uh, either. So, so we, we, as we were doing these processes, we were so pleasantly delighted and surprised to discover that setting up this type of a context where there's multiple opportunities, just, just having the option to, to piece out if you want to, uh, didn't negatively impact the, the pacing or the, the, the efficacy of the, of the, of the procedures in the skill-based treatment room. Yeah. And if I recall correctly from the paper too, you know, like, I, th I think this is what you're, you're, you're getting at here. It's, you know, a lot of kids, despite the opportunity to just escape, they, they, they did spend a good amount of time uh, choosing to, to, to earn, reinforcers contingently uh, as opposed to get them for free which is uh, uh, obvious that there's you know as you cite in the paper there's literature that supports that but at the same time there's a, there's a counterintuitive piece to that as well so um, one of the things I also liked about the paper too is that uh, you know it sounds like you, you you know in study one was done at a clinic but study two was done in a school library you know? That's right. And, and and what I really, really like about that is because like, it's kind of like the, the episode for the consultants with children in session 145 is that like, I can picture myself doing that, you know, whereas I can't picture myself uh, in a, in a university lab with two way mirrors and cameras and, you know, uh, a, a flock of, of people taking IOA and, you know, all, all the trappings of, of, of a research setting. Because I've 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 never operated in in, an air, in a setting like that, but the fact that you the with the second cohort of, of participants, you did that in in, in a library. And can you tell 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 the the audience about the little modification you made because you didn't have like a hangout room, right? Right. Yeah. Sure. So yeah, I I I think that it follows the spirit of first things first, or FTF, as some might recognize or might abbreviate. Uh, we, we first wanted to demonstrate in a context where we did have a lot of control over the, the reinforcers and, and over the context, uh, over the over the room, uh, we wanted to demonstrate that that kids might choose to practice when they had an option to to, to hang out concurrently. Uh, but but once we had seen that it could work, that kids weren't just sitting and hang out all day, we wanted to extend the procedures and we were, it was just a kismet. We, we had been were, uh, I had been interacting with some folks down at Vanderbilt and Vanderbilt University Medical Center uh, who really did all of the work down, down there in, in this specialized public school in Nashville, uh, specifically uh, Dr. Joey Stobitz, John Stobitz, and Kathleen Simcoe, who were, were BCBAs that were contracted by this, this specialized public school to help with some of their more challenging cases. And in the same vein that in our outpatient clinic, we were not 
certified to engage in any physical management restraint type procedures, these folks were considered non-school, non-district personnel and therefore were completely prohibited from putting hands on clients. Yet they were uh, being asked to serve children that were spending significant portions of their day in seclusion or in restraint. So we said, let's try this on for size. Let's see, let's, let's see if we can get this to work. So they did with, with two kiddos, uh, uh, I would say t- about 10 or 11 aged kiddos, they, they, they invited them into this library space, which is a bit of a larger room. And they put some tape down the line and they said, on this side of the room, we're going to do practice. And if at any point you're not feeling that, you can cross the tape and then that's it's like a force field. And we, <laughs> we wouldn't dare put any EOs uh, in place during, in that hangout space. So they also made it work, you know, in, in a school. And, and th- there were some other kind of sensitivities. Which, it, it was a bit different. As I mentioned, working in an outpatient clinic, you have that the benefit of it is an entirely new universe where you can set the tone. You can set the contingencies. In this room, these are the rules. By contrast, this library was a room that these kids had spent some time in, sometimes for, you know, detention, but other times for uh, just, just for their other reading activities, reading intervention stuff. So it, it worked out in the school where they would just, their normal day would proceed, they would be in class, and then these non-district personnel, the BCBAs and their graduate interns um, would, would invite them. Would you like to come play the My Way game is, I think, how they, how they frame, framed it. And so the children had the opportunity to choose to exit their classroom uh, for better or for worse, you know, depending on what's going on in the class, <laughs> they might want to stay or go and then go experience a very carefully uh, systematically engineered treatment uh, in another space. And so another way of looking at it is these kids had had an opportunity to go spend an hour hanging out or go spend an hour learning some skills with, with some fun kind of graduate student interns and, and with some BCBAs that uh, really know their stuff. So I, I think that that was one of the big accommodations. Was there was there anything? Yeah, else? that's what I was referring to. That the the force field is the thing. You know, the <laughs> the 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 the, 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 ta- the 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 tape on the floor. I think that was a pretty novel way of solving that problem of not having enough space. Which is anyone who's doing school consulting, that you know, unless you're really really fortunate, uh, you're always dealing with space issues, and you're always grabbing someone's office who's not you know who stepped out or who's in a meeting and stuff like that. So the 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 uh, I guess the uh, uh, the practicality of this type of process I kind of came through in 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 reading that paper that it's not something it's something that can be done pretty much anywhere and not uh, not just highly specialized environments. Yes, and and I'll readily admit that we had quite a few resources in terms of personnel. We did have a BCBA who was coaching a graduate intern and I was kind of following the, the process remotely. Um, but we also, but, but that level of personnel really also helped us extend the procedures, extend the outcomes of the skill-based treatment back into the classroom where the original problem was being reported. So in addition to kids choosing to come, you know, skipping down the hall to come play the, the My Way game, uh, choosing to practice a majority of the time, once we taught them the the skills that they were that that you might say were were deficit were deficient, um, we we invited their classroom teachers, their paras, to learn the procedures in that you might say in that more highly controlled context of the library. And once they were successful, we then also brought it back. You know, we we, we used behavior skills training. We were, we had did some planning with the team to try to see can we recreate something similar in your classroom. And and that was another thing where we needed to work within the constraints of the of the of the environment. They were like, we can't put tape down in the in the middle of a classroom. So what are we going to do? They they used a they programmed a common stimulus that that signaled that it was a hangout space. I think it was just kind of like a little red little triangle that um, we were using in the hangout space. And then they basically just put it at one table in the classroom. And they taught once they transitioned and extended the procedures and outcomes back into the classroom. It, it just sort of became something that was tenable and, and uh, that was okay by the classroom teachers and the paras to say at any point in time, uh, Peter and Hank, who are the two the pseudonyms of the two kiddos that we did this with, you can go sit at the hangout table and you can even take your preferred toys with you. And that is something that potentially uh, ha- can be a durable kind of treatment procedure that that stays in the classroom uh, for these for these kiddos. So 
that was another neat extension of the process uh, where we also ultimately stretched it across an entire math block, an entire reading and writing block so that kids were doing the dance between going between reinforcement and cooperating with uh, heavy adult instruction, math, writing, reading, group work. Um, all the while they had that hangout option, but they weren't, they weren't choosing it in the classroom. But by the end of this process, they were like, I'm here, I'm a student now, I'm, I'm, I'm engaged, I wanna learn. Wow, that's, uh, man, I get, that can go in so many directions. You know, one of the things that I see on a day-to-day -day basis is the extent to which teachers struggle with classroom management. And uh, certainly, I, I think there was actually a paper that just came out this morning that I saw someone post on Twitter about the, you know, all the barriers to training classroom management and teacher training uh, prep programs. Uh, so yeah, to have something like this and, you know, perhaps some other tools uh, to to help with these uh, these learners with these profiles would, would be awesome. So um, very cool. I, I, I want to talk a little bit about, uh, I have another question that I want to throw at you here. Um, you know, and so the the ability to kind of turn behavior on and off through this, uh, you know, the through the processes that we've talked about thus far, um, I I have worked with with learners that uh, uh, for their repertoire seems to kind of take on a life of their own once they're once once the quote unquote behavioral incident or the episodes underway, uh, and. Um, you know, this might get to the 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 the, the objection you raised during my uh, panel <laughs> at ABAI. Uh, we'll, we'll come back to that in a minute, but uh, you know, so uh, but with, with with some of these some of these students that I've I've tried to support uh, over the years, that you know, w once their behavior got underway, it seemed like other reinforcers. Were, were driving the continuation of the behavior. Maybe, maybe the behavior was, you know, initially reinforced by some combination of like not wanting to do the particular task, maybe not, you know, maybe there wasn't compliance with their idiosyncratic demands or something along those lines. And once they were, uh, uh, you know, for lack of a better word, triggered and they were already engaging in aggression and property destruction, that the the continuation of those those responses were reinforced by the outcomes that those responses produced in terms of uh, like you know I, I've worked with so many kids who like have engaged in massive levels of property destruction you know like you know mm -hmm. just so so tearing books out of the bookshelf climbing up on stuff pulling things down and there's part of me that thinks like wow that actually from that student if I step back you know, between dodging things that are getting thrown at me, uh, that actually looks inherently reinforcing to the student. In other words, it's not necessarily socially mediated. You know, he's pulling the border off of a bulletin board. And in the act of doing so, all the little staples are popping out and it's very, you know, it's it's got this kind of satisfying, you know, kind of, uh, you know, as all the, you know, I mean, anyone's worked with kids who've done this and probably know what I'm talking about here. Um, or if they're climbing up on something or I've had kids who uh, who are, you know, who are trying to hit me and I'm trying to like, you know, uh, block and, you know, get out of the way and things like that. And then I'll, then it seems to me like they're almost playing a video game in their mind. And I'm like, it, this is like some boss battle that they're engaged in. So they're, you know, I've had some kids who are like, actually really, you know, they, they would be savvy in, in you know, in, in, in boxing or something like, cause they, they're like, they, they'd, they'd like give a jab and then like try to get me to move one way, anticipating me, you know, so they can get in on the other side, you know? So I, I guess what I'm saying is, is that do you see, there's and all the while, you know, for, for some of these individuals, we would promise them heaven and earth, you know. In other words, we'd remove the, the EOs were relatively removed, or the ones we thought. Uh, so for 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 kids who whose problem behavior might be, you know, you know, there's this term sometimes that gets used, you know, signs of damage as a reinforcer, instrumental aggression, and things like that. I'm just curious to what your general thoughts are about these matters. And, and and how to support kids for whom like when you when you do try to remove demands give all sorts of attention and things like that that uh you know they're still nonetheless engaging in problematic behavior yeah i, I don't have an analytical 
answer to this question. That is, we haven't, I haven't done the FA on signs of damage as, as the reinforcer. Um, but I have, I mean, these three kids that I'm describing, Jeffrey, especially, and then, and also uh, Peter and Hank, who were the, 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 the young men that we worked with in the school, uh, absolutely fit this profile. That is once the episode started, it sometimes took hours for it to stop. And it was, uh, really drawn out across multiple rooms. And, and if there was a, an individual that they were uh, quote unquote uh, mad at that they would not give up until they, they had, that person had a scar. And I've also there were some children I worked with at the New England Center who, who were a similar way. So what I wanna say is that these, these young men had fit that profile and I don't have the technical language for it, but I, 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 when I think about it, because I, because I've seen us be able to turn on and off their less dangerous behavior, be able to turn on and off their precursors, I do. Uh, some of these words that come to mind are, are, are. I think that there's a lack of trust among those those people and the adults in their life, and I also think that there's a great deal of unpredictability in the context where those major episodes happen, to the extent where it's like, what do I need to do to get you off my back, or what do I need to do to send you? the message that this is not how you should treat me. And mm -hmm. so when we work with those kids, we often find out that, that what we often at least hear the story that it's practiced. It's, didn't, it's, not, the, it's not a one-time, one-off thing. It's uh, people that have lived a lifestyle of physical management, restraint, being told to go into the corner and then they're, and, and, or being told that they've lost their sticker for the day. So they're not able to earn their end of day trip or treat or token, whatever, whatever it is. And it's, it, there, there's this element of, well, all bets are off. So uh, what, what we need to acknowledge is that those events, um, just in addition to the appearance that they might appear to serve an automatically reinforcing function, those events are powerful ways to change your circumstances. When you are in the room and then you flip a table and then you continue to flip tables, everybody leaves. You, you know, and, and that may not be what you want is like escape from people, but you're controlling your environment in a, in a very significant high octane way. So our solution, uh, or, or it, it, it teaches me to emphasize two things in that initial assessment, which are to, to really try to create a context where everything is more predictable, right? Where we can, can, can not just be, you know, uh, we're not just delivering one reinforcer and then waiting for you to flip another table before we say, okay, fine. Now, now I really don't want to make you do your math homework. Um, we try to really try to recreate a context, but, but do so in a way that's highly predictable and black and white for the learner. And then secondarily is, is we, we ask a ton of questions about those less dangerous responses, about those early signs, the signs that sometimes the teachers are, when they see the grimace on their child's face, they're like, this is going to be a two hour episode, isn't it? We just try to take that sign, uh, that precursor response as an indication that we need to, to, to deliver synthesized reinforcement, all the reinforcement early and immediately and uh, comprehensively. And time and time again, that has been uh, sufficient to turn off behavior. Jeffrey's the only client I've ever worked with where we, we, we really struggled to turn off behavior in the reinforcing context. And it didn't take too much uh, detective work to realize that there were reinforcers missing from that context. His dad was missing. I, I was escaped from me was missing. Um, can, can I ask? A, those are some thoughts. So, so would you see a circumstance of offering maybe a, a, different reinforcer that, than the one that may be maintaining the problem behavior if the reinforcer that's that's suspected or, or hypothesized as a result of the interview is something that's also very disruptive. Uh, so what I mean by that is that uh, I'll get, you know, the example that comes to mind is that, you know, if a kid in the third grade classroom uh, really enjoys uh, making disruptive noises or well, let me just or, or engaging in, in some sort of play that's disruptive uh, in the while the teacher's trying to teach a lesson uh, and that and engaging in that recruits a ton of reinforcement in the ways in which you just described similar to flipping the table uh, have you in practice or you know um, perhaps maybe offered a a different reinforcer for the for that for that student because we can't 
uh, we my way can't fly in the classroom because it's sure. disruptive. Yeah, I, 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 I don't think that we make that decision on the front end per se. So if, if uh, loud stereotypy, access to, to loud stereotypy is a, is a reinforcer, we acknowledge the power of those of that event as a reinforcing event. And generally, when we do this sort of pull out model of assessment and treatment, and, and, and I want to be clear, there are some folks that have been successful just doing this treatment in media res. Um, I, for, for several reasons, I like to kind of do that, to try to recreate some level of a pullout model to do treatment because it allows you to massage out these types of kinks. So we might start with a situation where my way means you can yell and I'll yell with you and I'll even make it more fun for you. Once we've built a repertoire of skills, then we could start to tease that down. Then we could say, listen, that uh, in this room, we can't have that loud of a thing, but maybe we can choose to go into this other room where you can yell all that you want. And that, that really does, I, I don't think that that's where we want to start because we do want to use the, all of the reinforcers at our disposal to teach all the skills that we want to teach. So, so one answer, I know it's kind of like a political, you know, I, I hope I'm not dancing around the question too much, is, is start by granting it and then slowly work on eroding that, the availability of that thing or maybe come up with some sort of a, a proxy. I if, I, if I can connect this to the previous conversation, um, signs of damage as a, as a reinforcer, one version of that that I think of are, are young boys who, or, or young children who just like to kind of wrestle, you know, that maybe it's because of their history, physical management procedures. Oh, sure, yeah. And so we do try to sometimes create a proxy uh, of that. That is, we might have a gym mat in the reinforcement space and we tell kids, we, we can go there and we can play wrestle all we want. We want to make sure that we're doing it there. And I want to grant you the rest, the, the, the level of play that you're looking for. You know, I want to, I want to make sure that it's as intense as, as you want it to be with the whole WWE. Uh, but being able to, to, to put that under the stimulus control of the gym mat uh, is also facilitated by creating really clear, strong rules about this is where fun happens and this is where kind of work happens. Um, so, so th there's another, you know, when it comes to things where we're like the reinforcer itself is dangerous, we are often able to either come up with a workaround or talk about, uh, 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 with our treatment team, what are the conditions under which we can allow it? And then how do we build toward tolerance of it not being allowed? And when we're now talking about tolerance of it not being allowed, that just goes right into the process of teaching, coping, cooperation, and communication. Very cool. Uh, so. I, I want to uh, talk about that that uh, that uh, panel uh, that you asked that question on. Uh, <laughs> no, it's funny. I, I, you know, it was a, so so. I uh, it was the I think it was like the last day of ABAI and right. uh, uh, of uh, the last was that's probably the last one that was actually done in person, if I'm not mistaken. Um, that's right, May 2019. I, I would say it's in Chicago, but that's not specific enough for ABAI. Uh, um, <laughs> but uh, anyway, um, so so I don't even remember the question I was responding to, but I make just kind of like an off the cuff comment. I, the question I think had to do with like dealing with very dangerous behavior and stuff like that. And I said something like, well, you know, I mean, there are going to be times where restraints are inevitable. Um, and your hand shot right up. I believe. And, uh, uh, so, so to uppity graduate student thing of me to do. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, uh, I, so, so, so remind, uh, tell the audience what, what, what the point you were trying to get across and I'll, I'll, I'll try <laughs> I'll try to, uh, uh, recall my feeble response to it. So. Sure. Uh, my, even my memory at this point is a little bit uh, uh, dodgy on this, but there was a, a question about restraint, seclusion, uh, uh, controversy surrounding restraint, the social validity, I think, uh, of it. And I, I, I think generally the, 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 the panel um, response, which is, I think, uh, indicative of the response in our field is that, listen, restraints happen. Let, kind of, we, we, we need to acknowledge that and then do what we can to, to minimize it. And I, I really apologize if I, <laughs> for my uppity tone, because I, I now looking back, I, that probably wasn't necessary. But I, I was in the thick of this, this study, and, and one of our take-home points of this enhanced choice model is that it is possible 
to, to, to not only manage, but to address and to treat uh, dangerous problem behavior without needing to evoke dangerous problem behavior in the process. And I, we only have a, a, an initial proof of concept. I, I, you know, I know that, that we only have five applications, but some of my thoughts as I, I've been thinking about this a lot, especially as we've been uh, talking as a, as a research group and with some colleagues about trauma-informed care is that if our, if from the outset, our position is restraint happens, let's figure out how we can do it in a safer way or, or how we can reduce it, then that sets us up to, to keep it in our uh, tool belt of, of things. If by contrast, you're in a position where restraint is not legal, tenable, you know, the kids are too large, that the school setting doesn't allow it, uh, that, it, it, that uh, necessarily did help us uh, lead to a different set of procedures and lo and behold, we, we, we found that there were ways to mitigate problem behavior that didn't require needing physical management. So um, I, I, think that, uh, I, I think that that would be an interesting position for our field to, to, to move toward, to evolve, is, is, is what, if, what, what would we need to come up with if restraint was entirely just not feasible? And that, you know, that, that there's, there's DNA in our literature where we have studies showing the not only the efficacy of, but the necessity of physical guidance in escape extinction procedures. It's basically saying kids didn't get reductions in problem behavior until you physically guided them through their demands. We see that certainly in, in, the, in the feeding literature, but also in, in the problem behavior literature. And I'm not here to, to criticize that research because that, that uh, clearly it's on those the shoulders of those giants on which we stand to learn new things. Uh, rather, I'm saying that has set us up to uh, respond to these concerns in a particular way. And by contrast, with the, with the with the in 2021, if we can if we have the opportunity to, to move towards suggest that it's possible to uh, help these kids without needing to put hands on them, then uh, to to me that sets up a whole new research agenda, research program. It sets up a whole new. Um, motto for practice. And I will one more, uh, at least one more time, allude back to episode 145, where they, they said that it's their mantra at the start of their meetings as safety first, safety first, televisability first. That just really sets a different tone and it sets a different uh, set of guidelines under which to write your behavior intervention plan. Great, great. Well, I, you know, I, uh, as much as I was kind of thrown off and uh, probably just, uh, you know, emitted some word salad as a response to, to, to your comment in the moment. Uh, I, I appreciate the, uh, the, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a worthwhile point to consider. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I you know, I could probably, you know, I, you know, I, I, th I think there's probably a considerable amount of overlap in terms of our points of view on this, uh, you know, and, um, and I think the point perhaps maybe I was trying to make is that there are going to be times where, you know, a kid is not or a learner is not uh, enrolled in any treatment and they're coming to you uh, without any uh, any skills in their repertoire and you don't have knowledge of what, you know, sets them off. So you can't turn off the behavior and things like that and that um, and things like that. And so that perhaps that was the, the, the context of where I was kind of saying restraint is going to be uh, something that, ha that happens from time to time, uh, that despite the, you know, um, our wanting it not to, but, uh, yeah, it was, it yeah. was, it was a fun moment. It was part of it. It was, it was, it was funnier at the time, I suppose. You know, I was thinking, <laughs> man, we were just drinking beer together like the <laughs> night before. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's my it's my first invited panel. You know, oh my but, goodness, uh, I I didn't mean to be two faced. I'm, I'm no, glad you're you were you're, no, it's fun. I'm just joking. <laughs> but but no, to be to be honest, if I can just add a little bit sure. more to this, I, I I gave so one of my my like take home point slide when I share these enhanced choice model data is a is a is a one slide that says it is possible to to uh, produce socially meaningful improvements in problem behavior without ever touching clients and without any escalation of, of dangerous problem behavior. And uh, a little over a year ago, I, I gave a version of that talk um, to a bunch of BCBAs and one BCBA uh, kind of came up to me after that. And they said, so are you telling me that I'm a bad BCBA because I, I do use physical management procedures when, I, when kids are in crisis? And that uh, broke my heart because that was absolutely not the, the, the message that I wanted to send. So I, I wish I could go back to ABBA 2019 for, for multiple reasons. One being in-person conferences are 
amazing. Uh, but but second, so that I could I could give a little bit more, uh, I could have given a little more thought to my response because I certainly don't mean to say that in emergency situations that restraints will never be required anymore. What I what I believe is that um, you know there's a there's a handbook of crisis prevention and crisis management uh, for individuals with IDD. I think it was edited by. Uh, doctors Derek and Florence De Janeiro Reed and someone else who I can't remember at the time, but um, uh, Dr. Wayne Fisher wrote it, writes a chapter in there about using protective equipment and uh, and basically protective restraints. And it, they, he does a really nice job with his co-authors uh, outlining kind of reasons why we might use physical management in, in ABA practice. And one is emergencies, okay, to keep things safe. The other is as part of a behavior plan the other is sort of, you know, the other two are, are somewhat almost function based. It's like you might do a timeout if an analysis indicates that positive reinforcers are reinforcing. So I like using that as a uh, trichotomy. I don't know. I like using that as a, as a branching because it helps me to make the point that I wish to make, which is that I, I don't necessarily uh, mean to say that all restraint will be eliminated for forever but that we can greatly reduce the extent to which we're using any of these procedures in our behavior intervention plans, given uh, what we now know about uh, other ways to turn behavior off in the moment and also just using synthesizing treatment packages that really promote safety uh, throughout the treatment process. Great. Uh, Great and that. in doing so, if, if one last thing, if we sure. if we are proactive about these safety tactics, and I'm happy to talk about other ones that I think that we've we've kind of uh, learned are are more or less important along the way, uh, I think that we can greatly reduce the amount and the and the danger associated with the emergency restraint procedures that happen uh, in, in our day to day. I see. Very cool. Well, I appreciate you. Uh, uh, the additional put it, uh, providing the additional context for that. That's that's helpful. And to uh, ho hopefully that PCBA came up to you is uh, we'll we'll tune into this. And uh, uh, she here, she's here. a close colleague of mine, so we had a a lengthy discussion. Oh, okay. Following that. <laughs> all right. All right. All right. Very cool. Uh, I, I I could keep asking you questions uh, for for uh, quite a while, and we need to get some Patreon stuff, uh, 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 bonus content here in just a minute here. So let's wrap up the uh, this episode here, uh, did too. And um, what uh, uh, what advice do you have for the newly minted BCBA? Oh man, this is one I, I I've thought about it because I know that you've been asking guests. You know the question's <laughs> coming. I know the question's <laughs> coming, but I still don't feel like I have a good answer. So I I I I like to think of it. I, I wish that I was cool enough to say that John Lewis's good trouble uh, represented who I was as a young clinician, but uh, I'm not that cool. But I I think that new people entering the field, whether you're coming in as a behavior technician or a BCBA. I think that we're at a point now where if something doesn't feel right in your practice, that is, if you are working with a client and you, you're, the guidelines say that you need to ignore this or not communicate with them under these conditions or you need to follow through on these demands, if that feels icky to you, if it feels icky to members of your team, you're probably on to something. And you're probably in a, you know, you're in a position to question those things simply because they feel icky. And I say that coming from a place where I, I remember having maybe private feelings like this doesn't feel good that we're um, in doing restraints so, so many times a day, but it was often met with, met with, well, this is what the data are teaching us we need to do, or, you know, this is, th these are the function-based solutions to the problem. And uh, I just think that we're at a place where we can, we're going to need to do a lot more work on truly ways to address challenging behavior that 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 really minimize the danger and the escalation in the process but beginning to get into some good trouble about that to speak up and say i want to make it known that i don't feel comfortable doing x with 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 this client um i think that puts it on blast in a way that 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 behavior analysts could benefit from um in a, in a in a i'm working um on some uh, right, co-authoring a paper with some excellent colleagues, Dr. Jen Austin, uh, Dr. Tony Camilleri, Dr. Holly Gover, Dr. David Donnelly, and Dr. Greg Hanley, and we're talking. We're, we're trying to 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 talk about trauma-informed care, and 
every every step of the way in, in coming up with the argument for why we should consider trauma-informed care, we have the voice of behavior analysis in the back of the head that says, well, you haven't demonstrated its necessity. We, we you, you haven't demonstrated that it may not have counter-therapeutic effects. And our rebuttal to all of these things, when we when we think about how they're how we don't have a ton of great efficacy data about embracing trauma-informed care is that is that, that we don't also know that the added benefits to these procedures, and there's a great deal of humility, social acceptability, and uh, televisability, for lack of a better word, to be had in embracing approaches to a treatment of problem behavior that are uh, that put the client dignity and humanity uh, at the forefront. So uh, all of this is to say, if things feel icky, they probably are for, for, for more than one person. And, and being vocal about that is, is, a, is one way to start the conversation toward uh, safer, more dignifying treatment procedures. Awesome. Well, I think that uh, I think you did a great job. So uh, the, all that apprehension was unnecessary. To do, so <laughs> thanks for joining oh, me. Oh, I have one more little nugget. I'm oh, so yeah, please, I'm please. Yeah. yeah, go right ahead. Another little nugget is to, to, to do ABA in more than one context if you're able to. And even if that means switching from one team in a school to another team in a school, uh, though that type of multiple exemplar training, even though it kind of happens naturally, was uh, so incredibly influential and helpful for me, not only to, to, to learn the ABA concepts a bit better, but to see that there is more than one way to skin Skinner a cat. Uh, that that there's there's uh, absolutely not uh, there's rarely just one solution to every problem, and being able to just see how different clinicians and different even like strong technicians how they interact with kids, uh, that 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 stuff uh, can can really make a difference and and can also teach you where you want to go where you want to ultimately be in your career. So, if you're able to work in more than one setting, not just in one setting. Awesome. Oh, wow. It's a, it's a, it's a bon bonus bit of advice. So, uh, all right. Very cool. Uh, uh, D2, uh, we're definitely uh, going to have some more conversations with you down the road, but uh, thanks for, for joining me today for this, this initial one. Thanks so much for having me uh, a couple, a year or so in the making, but uh, uh, this has been a real treat and uh, keep doing what you're doing, Matt. Uh, I've, it's amazing. Thanks. <laughs> it's really, really changed my whole podcasting uh, experience. Oh, all right. Happy to do it. Okay. So uh, we're wrapping up the, uh, the public feed here and we're on to the, uh, the, the Patreon kind of bonus round uh, did too. So um, these are folks in my, my uh, Patreon or membership group. Um, and uh, so I've got questions from Dave, Celia, and Hillary. Um, but first, uh, why should we care about cricket? Oh, my A little, little palate cleanser. I see you post about cricket sometimes on Facebook, and I know nothing about it. So uh, it, what am I missing out on? I'm going to be honest. I didn't see this in the, in the PDF before. And I'm, I'm so it's like a, a right. candy store. I'm so excited. We should care about cricket. Thank you for listening to the Behavioral Observations Podcast with Matt Sicoria. You can find Matt's notes on this episode at www.behavioralobservations.com. We also invite you to stay connected with us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash behavioral observations and on Twitter at Behavior Podcast. <laughs>